Chapter 3 of Danger in Deep Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Danger in Deep Space by Kerry Rockwell. Narrated by Sam Holloway. Chapter 3. Well, looks like we're big boys now, said Tom, as the three cadets strolled down the corridor away from Captain Strong's office. They don't hand out secret and important missions to cadet units unless they're really on the ball. But we've got Major Blastoff Connell to educate, grumbled Roger. What do you mean, educate? asked Astro. You know he's the roughest officer in the academy, replied the blonde-haired cadet. He eats cadets for breakfast, lunch and dinner, and then has an extra one for dessert. He isn't just tough, his hide's made of armour plate. But I've got a hunch that if we play dumb at first, then smarten up slowly, we can make him feel that he's done it for us. So he'll be easier on us. Say, it's after eleven, exclaimed Tom. We'd better hurry. Suddenly, as if a rocket cruiser were blasting off in the corridors, a roar, deafening and powerful, filled their ears. And beneath its ferocity, there were four unmistakable words. Polaris unit! Stand to! Every muscle, every bone in their three bodies snapped to rigid attention simultaneously. Eyes straight, chins in, the cadets waited for whatever calamity had befallen them. From behind came quick, heavy footsteps. They drew closer until they passed alongside and then abruptly stopped. There, in front of them, stood the one and only Major Blastoff Connell. Though a few inches shorter than Astro, he was what Astro might become in 30 years, heavily muscular, with a barrel chest that filled the gold and black uniform tightly. He stood balanced on the balls of his small feet like a boxer, hands hanging loosely at his sides. A bulldog chin jutted out of his rough-hewn face as if it were going to snap off the head of the nearest cadet. He towered over Tom and Roger, and though shorter than Astro, he made up for this by sheer force of personality. When he spoke, his voice was like a deep foghorn that had suddenly learned the use of vowels. So, this is the great Polaris unit, eh? He bellowed. You're two minutes late! Tom suddenly felt that he and his unit mates were all alone in that corridor with the Major. He glanced to one side, then the other, cautiously, and saw it was empty. And for good reason. No one wanted to be around when Blastoff Connell was blasting. Cadets, enlisted men and even officers were not safe from his sudden outbursts. He drove himself so hard that he became impatient with others who weren't able to match his drive. It was not because of ego, but rather to get the job at hand finished. More than once he addressed down a captain of the Solar Guard in the same tone he used on a green earthworm. It was legend around the Academy that once, believing he was right, he'd broken into the council chamber itself to argue his point. He won by a unanimous decision. Nothing but nothing had been devised or thought of that could stop Blastoff Connell. Every waking moment of his adult life had been spent in the pursuit of more and more knowledge about space, space travel and life on the other planets. Now his wrath at fever pitch at their being tardy, he stood in front of the cadets, turning his anger on Roger first. Your name's Manning, isn't it? He growled. Yes, sir, replied Roger. Father got a medal. He used to be a solar guard officer. That's right, sir. He was killed in space. Nah, no. He was a good man. You'll never be the man he was if you live ten thousand years. But if you don't try to be a better man than he was, you won't live five minutes with me. Is that clear, Cadet Manning? Very clear, sir, gulped Roger. Connell turned to Astro. And you're the homegrown atomic rocket genius. Venusian style, eh? Yes, sir, choked Astro. I'm from Venus. Bucked rockets on the old chemical burners as a kid before entering the academy, eh? Asked Connell. There was less than an inch and a half between Astro's face and Major Connell's jaw. Yes, sir, answered Astro. I was an enlisted man before coming to the academy. Well, get this, you rocket buster, roared Connell. I want a power deck that would give me what I want when I want it. Or you'll be back in the ranks again. Is that clear, Cadet Astro? 
Yes, sir. Everything she's got, when you want it, sir. And I like to have a power deck, clean enough to eat off the deck plates. Yes, sir. Stuttered Astro, growing more and more confused. You like to eat off the deck plates, sir. By the craters of Luna, no! I don't like to eat off the deck plates, but I want them clean enough to eat there if I want to. Yes, sir. Astro's voice was hardly above a whisper. And you're the tactical wizard that won the space manoeuvres recently? Single-handed, eh? Asked Connell, bending down to face Tom. Our side won, sir, if that answers your question, replied Tom. He was as nervous as Roger and Astro, but he fought for control. He was determined not to be bullied. I didn't ask you who won, snapped Connell. But you're the one just the same. Control deck, cadet, eh? Well, you work with me. On the control deck, there's only room for one brain, one decision, one answer. And when I'm on the control deck, that decision, answer, and brain will be mine! I understand perfectly, sir, said Tom tonelessly. Connell stepped back, fists on his hips, eyeing the three cadets. He had heard about their difficulty in fitting personalities together when they had first arrived at Space Academy, as described in Standby for Mars. And he had heard about their triumph over the Martian desert. He was impressed with everything he had learnt about them, but he knew that he had a reputation for being tough, and that this reputation usually brought out the best in cadets. Early in his long and brilliant career, he had learnt that his life depended on the courage and ingenuity of his fellow spacemen. When he became an instructor at the academy, he had determined that no cadet would ever be anything but the best, and that when they blasted off in their later years, they could be depended on. He looked at the three cadets and felt a tinge of excitement that did not show on his scowling face. Yes, he thought. They'll make spacemen. It'll take a little time. But they're good material. Now listen to this, he bawled. We blast off for Venus Space Station in exactly 30 minutes. Get your gear aboard the Polaris and stand by to race ship. He dropped his voice and pushed out his jaw a little farther. This will be the toughest journey you'll ever make. You'll either come back spaceman, or you'll come back nothing. I'm going to try my best to make it. He paused and added coldly, Nothing. Because if you can't take it from me, then you don't belong in space! Unit dismissed! He turned on his heel and disappeared up the slide stairs without another look at the three rigid cadets. Yeah, we'll educate him, all right, said Astro softly with a wink at Tom. Make him think he's done everything for us. Ah, go blast your jets, snarled Roger after he'd found his voice. Come on, said Tom. Let's get the Polaris ready. And fellows, I mean ready. Bill Loring and Al Mason stood near the entrance to the control tower of the Academy spaceport and watched the three cadets of the Polaris scramble into the giant rocket cruiser. Every time I think about that Connell kicking us out of space for 12 months, I want to pound his head in with a wrench, snarled Loring. Mason snorted. Well, what's the use of us hanging around here? He asked. That Connell wouldn't have us aboard the Polaris, even if we were cleared and had our papers. There ain't a thing we can do. Don't give up so easy. There's a fortune setting up there in space, just waiting for me and you to come and take it. And no big shot solar guard officer is going to keep me from getting it. Yeah, yeah, grumbled Mason. But what are you going to do about it? I'll show you what I'm going to do, said Loring. We're heading for Venusport. Venusport? By the moons of Jupiter, what are we going to do there? Get a free ride to Terra. But how? I only got a few hundred credits, and you ain't got much more. There ain't nobody going to go 50 billion miles on nothing. Loring's eyes followed the massive figure of Major Connell on the slidewalk as it swept across the spaceport field toward the Polaris. You just buy us a couple of seats on the next rocket to Venus Sport and stop asking stupid questions. When we see Major Blastoff Connell again, we'll be giving the orders with a parallel ray. 
The two disgruntled spacemen turned quickly and walked to the nearest slidewalk, disappearing around a building. Aboard the Polaris, Tom confronted his two unit mates. Now look, fellas. After the hard time Major Connell just gave us, let's see if we can't really stay on the ball from now on. All right with me, Tom, Astro said, nodding his head. You're having space dreams, Corbett, drawled Roger. No matter what we do for old Blastoff, we'll wind up behind the eight ball. But if we really try, urged Tom, if we all do our jobs, there can't be anything for him to fuss about. We'll make it tough for him to give us any demerits, Astro chimed in. Right, said Tom. It won't work, grumbled Roger. You saw the way he chewed us up. And for what? I ask you, for what? He was just trying to live up to his reputation, Roger, replied Tom. But common sense will tell you that if you're on the ball, you won't get demerits. What's the matter, hotshot? Growled Astro. Afraid of a little work? Listen, you Venusian clunk, sneered Roger. I'll work the pants off you any day in the week, and that includes Titan Days too. OK, Tom smiled. Save half of that energy for the Polaris, Roger. Yeah, use some of that manning hot air to shine brass, suggested Astro. Come on, let's get this wagon in shape, said Tom. He turned to the instrument panel on the great control board. A moment later, the three cadets were busy shining the few bits of brass and rechecking the many controls and levers. Suddenly, there was the sound of a hatch slamming below, and then Astro's voice came whispering over the intercom. Watch it, fellas. Here he comes. The airtight hatch leading to the control deck slid back, and Major Connell stepped inside. With one sweeping glance, he took in the control deck and the evidence of their work. Unit! Stand! to He roared. Astro climbed into the control deck and snapped to attention with his unit mates as Connell began a quick but thorough check of the many dials and switches and relays on the control panel. Hmm, he mused. Been doing a little work, I see. Oh, nothing special, sir, said Roger. Well, from now on, it's gonna be special, roared Connell. Yes, sir, acknowledged Roger quickly. All right, at ease, ordered Connell. As the three boys relaxed, Connell stepped over to the astrogation board and snapped a switch. Immediately, a solar chart filled the huge chart screen. It was a black and white view of the planet Venus. This is where we're going first, he said, placing a finger on a ball-shaped satellite in orbit around the misty planet. This is the Venus space station. As you know, Venus has no natural satellite of his own, so we built one. We'll blast off from here and go directly to the space station, where the Polaris will be fitted with hyperdrive for deep space operations. While at the station, you will acquaint yourselves with the operation of the new audio communications transmitter. When I'm satisfied that you can handle it under the prevailing conditions of an extended space flight, We'll blast off for a test of its range and performance. Major Connell paused and faced the cadet squarely. Then he continued. This is an important mission. One which I hope will enable the Solar Guard to establish the first base outside of our solar system. Our destination is Tara, in the star system of Alpha Centauri. Tar is a planet in a stage of development similar to that of Earth several million years ago. Its climate is tropical, and lush vegetation, jungles really, covers a land surface. Two great oceans separate the land masses. One is called Alpha, the other Omega. I was on the first expedition when Tara was discovered, and have just returned from the second during which we explored it and ran tests to learn if it could sustain human life. All tests show that Tara can be transformed into a paradise. Connell paused, took in deep breath and continued. I shall expect more than just hard work from you. I want everything you have to offer. Not just good performance, but excellence. I will not tolerate anything less. And if I'm forced to resort to extreme disciplinary action to get what I demand, then you can expect to receive every demerit in the book. He stepped closer to the three cadets. Remember, spacemen or nothing. Now stand by to blast off. Without a word, the three cadets hurried to their stations and began routine procedure to raise ship. 
All departments ready to blast off, Major Connell, reported Tom, saluting sharply. Farewell, Corbett. Proceed, said Connell. Tom called into the intercom. Stand by for blast off. He then opened the circuit to the teleceiver screen overhead and spoke to the spaceport control tower. Polaris to spaceport control. Request permission to blast off. Request orbit. Spaceport traffic to Polaris. Your orbit has been cleared 089. Repeat 089. Blast off in two minutes. Orbit 089. Blast off minus 159. 58. You read me clear, Polaris. Tom clicked off the switch and turned to the intercom. Control deck to radar bridge. Do we have a clear tangent forward and up? All clear forward and up, Tom, replied Roger. Control deck to power deck. Energize the cooling pumps. Cooling pumps in operation, answered Astro briskly. The giant ship began to shudder as the mighty pumps on the power deck started their slow whining build-up. Tom sat in front of the control panel, strapped himself into the acceleration chair, and began checking the dials and gauges. Satisfied everything was in order, he fastened his eyes to the sweeping red second hand on the solar clock. The teleceiver screen brought a sharp picture of the surrounding base of the spaceship, and he saw that it was all clear. The second hand reached the ten-second mark. Stand by to raise ship, bawled Tom into the intercom. The red hand moved steadily, surely, to the zero at the top of the clock face. Tom reached for the master switch. Blast off minus five, four, three... Two, one, zero. Tom threw the switch. Slowly, the giant ship raised itself from the ground. Then, faster and faster, pushing the four spacemen deep into their acceleration cushions, it hurtled spaceward. In a few seconds, the Polaris was gravity-free. Once again, Earthman had started another journey to the stars. End of chapter three.